Hello there everyone and welcome to the 2023 edition of How Did Rod Do That? How did Rod predict an entire winter season before the winter season even starts? Here is the man himself, Rodney Hill. Uh, what this really is, is Rod's winter outlook. Something you've done for how many years now, Rod? We started this in the fall of uh, 2000, so we're racking them up. Now, now keep in mind, the crazy profession that I chose is one where you're trying to be right a lot more than you are wrong, but to some degree, it's a statistical game. I probably shouldn't say this, but we've had really good luck on the winter outlook the last several years, yep. which means I'm kind of statistically due for a fail, but let's no, hope it's no. not this year. No, I don't believe that, Rod. <laughs> what I do believe is last year, man, you hit one element of your, I know we'll talk about this in a minute, but yeah. he hit one element of his winter outlook last year, basically right on the head. It was pretty incredible. We'll get to that in a moment, but where do you want to start yeah. as far as this year's outlook? Well, I want to start in, we're going to tie back to this theme of this being a wild card, December of 2015. So our viewers have probably all read or seen on social media or whatever that uh, this uh, is an El Nino winter coming up. And the first thing you may think of is this. This was last February. Drew just made mention of this. This was February 22nd. PDX put 11 inches of snow in the record book. It was the only big snow event that we had last winter. And the feather in my forecasting cap was, and you mentioned it. Yeah. I didn't think we had a great chance. I really didn't last fall. I didn't think we had a really good chance of having a winter storm. I did say, but if we were, if we were going to get hit with a snowstorm, it would happen somewhere in the last two weeks of February to the first couple days of March. And in fact, that hit on February 22nd. So those are the little headlines that we're trying to see if we can correctly predict. I want to brag about you for just a moment. I know it's uh, less comfortable when you brag about yourself. So honestly, again, <laughs> think about that. Last year, we were standing in this very spot at this very time, and four months out, Rod said, if we're going to get a major winter snowstorm, it's likely to happen in mid to late February. And I'm thinking, how does he know that? And then come mid to late February, I'm thinking, how did he know that? Bam. It happened. Well, we're not making this stuff up. So I'll, I'll tell you why that came into my reasoning. Now, again, I start doing my research typically September 1st is go time, and I give myself a good six weeks to grab little hours of time when I have to roll through and try to come up with every statistical correlation to find a reasoning uh, to make a statement that I can. So last year, remember, it was the third La Nina in a row. Right. But the early indications were that La Nina was going to start to weaken in early February, and by March, we would be into neutral. Guess what neutral phases favor? They favor snowstorms much more than the La Nina cycle. So that was the reasoning behind, well, I don't really think we have a good chance of getting one, but if we do, we'll get it as we pull out of La Nina, and that would be the end of February 1st of, of March, and that turned out to be sound reasoning. It turned out to be true. So your track record suggests you know what you're talking about. Let's get into this year's winter outlook then. This was amazing. This was uh, December of 2015, which was an El Nino season, the winter of 15 to 16. It's one of the years I'm looking most closely at. This was an amazing December. Portland picked up, do you remember this, Drew? 15, uh, what it was, 15.24 inches. It was the wettest month on record. Wetter than the 96 November. It was crazy. I remember that the, the Vernonia flood. Now this was like uh, one of two floods that happened about 15 years ago in Vernonia, right? This was the second of two big floods yeah. that happened out there. So the, the picture, the image we have here is, is downtown Klamath, which had, uh, I think more of an overall long-lasting flooding event than Vernonia did. Vernonia didn't get the bad flooding like we had a decade before, but they did have some. This December also produced one of the strongest tornadoes we've ever had recorded here in the Pacific Northwest period. It was an EF1 storm that hit Battleground with 140 mile per hour winds. I've got my notes. That particular storm in Battleground, get this, 36 homes reported at least some damage 104 mile per hour wind I guess nobody was hurt and you're like well tornadoes are very sporadic and they are but I just wanted to highlight December because December is an outlier of 15 to all the other El Nino months that I looked at and it is the reason why you're going to find a particular category of my outlook show up as a wild card coming up. So when you're putting together your outlook for a given year, let's say for this coming winter, you basically look at past winters that you think are going to most resemble the one we're about to experience. Yeah, it all starts with what we call the Enso cycle. We La Nina, El Nino, and neutral. You're probably all familiar, many of you, with the, those phases have certain stereotypes. One stereotype for El Nino is it's going to be mild and kind of quiet. But you can look at the degree of the prediction. Is it going to be a strong El Nino, a weak one, or a moderate one? And those conclusions are actually vastly different. Real quick, I do like Drew to include my report card. The one thing that I did not do well last year is I, I thought we'd have 
a mild, fairly warm, but wet November and December, and we didn't. In fact, it was quite cold in November and December. It was wetter than normal, but it was cold. That was one thing I missed. We set a drier January. That was correct. We had about 50% of normal precipitation for January. And then the big, so it's good to have a feather in your cap. And the big <laughs> feather in my cap a year ago was what Drew mentioned. Mid to late February, best chance for snow. We had the 11 inches, we showed you the pictures, February 22. And we had the record cold, too, of 18 degrees on February 25th. I should tell our viewers, when this happened early in the winter, we, we, we were concerned. And we called Rod's mom. We said, hey, Rod's struggling a little <laughs> bit right now in class. He needs to pick things up a little bit. And then Rod, he hit the books. And then he kicked some serious butt from there. So well done. A, a weak start, a strong finish, we call. Here is El Nino. Quick little re refresher course, Drew. Um, so El Nino, remember for these phases, neutral, La Nina, El Nino, we're talking about the water temperatures off the coast of South America down here in the equatorial belts. And when the water temperature is above normal by at least a half a degree Celsius, which is about a degree Fahrenheit or more, we call El Nino if that takes place for a certain period of time. That has happened. That's the phase that confidence is absolutely full that we will be in this winter. Now, what does that mean? Now, this is a stereotypical flow chart for El Nino. Typically, our, our neighbors down in California, it's when they can really get hammered with flooding rains, at least parts of the, of the, the Golden State. And then flooding heavy rains can also ride out an active southern branch of the jet stream into the Gulf Coast states into Florida. Now, cold shoots out of Canada typically stay off to our east, coming here into the upper Midwest. And we can be not only somewhat dry, but somewhat mild. Now, that's the stereotypical jargon that you get with El Nino. Now, I mentioned that it's important to note, is it gonna be a strong system? Right. Back in August, I mean, I look at social media too, right? We all see our different feeds of information. And the feeds were off the charts. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be a super El Nino. <laughs> Let me tell you, that was all a bunch of hogwash. Oh. That was way overdone. Hogwash. Hogwash. Wash the hogs with it. Yes, you do. <laughs> so here's the deal. To get what, what a lot of people are telling you, you have to be two degrees Celsius or more above. See the solid black line on the graphic? Yes. We never reached that. So here are the projections of spaghetti. Uh, what the heck? The spaghetti lines are all the different weather models. None of them approach two degrees above normal. I can follow this line. Yeah. Oh, I can't follow this. What is well, all this? this? Is, so these are all the different weather models. You know, all the different actual temperatures and weather models are predicting of those water temperatures and the equatorial waters. But notice we were actually at 1.5 back in uh, September in early October, now we've taken a little dip, but none of the modeling approaches two degrees full. They go between a degree and a degree and a half, so that's a moderate projection. And that's a whole different ball game than this jargon of, it's gonna be such a strong, super El Nino, and all this added hype, I will tell you as a professional, just drives me nuts, because it doesn't serve you well, it doesn't serve the profession that I work in well either. But that's what the numbers truthfully represent a moderate El Nino this season. All right, this, uh, this I can start to understand more clearly. Okay, yeah, you we're, were getting, getting a little science -y on me there for a moment. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's the background, uh, kind of the, the, the ground level of where my research starts. So in the, the black lines in these next, next graphics, these are the important pieces of research that I, conclusions that I came up with, or, or findings is probably a better way to put it. So the highest confidence call this year is that we are gonna be I think quite a bit above normal temperature wise in terms of when you average out the low and the high, the mean temperature. So this is interesting. The three seasons since 2000 that I'm looking at most carefully, and they were all moderate El Nino seasons, 2002 to three, 2009 to 10, and we talked about December 15 into 2016. So if you go November, March, the rainy season, five months. If you calculate those years, this is impressive, Drew. 13 of 15 months averaged to be above normal, almost every single one. So I'm thinking that's a strong conclusion to suggest we're gonna have a mild winter. So you're taking five months from each of those three years for a total of 15 months. Yeah. Got it. And 13 out of 15 are above normal. In fact, these are the actual averages I came out with. November was a full degree above normal. Yeah. December a full degree above normal. Yeah. But January came up in record territory plus four, that's off the charts warm, and February is about the same. And get this, Drew, if you could look at all the El Ninos. Yes. And we've been tracking El Nino, La Nina neutral since 1950. If you go back to 1950, four out of five of the warmest winter seasons have been, in fact, El Nino. All impressive indicators of a warm season coming up. So uh, just don't move off this chart just yet. Just okay. to kind of recap, I want to get inside your head. What you do first when you're coming up with the winter outlook, you, you realize it's going to be an El Nino in this case. Yeah. Then you decide on your own through all your data, how, how much of an El Nino is it going to be? 
moderate, extreme, right. low. You've determined on, with, all that, with all those numbers that it's going to be an El Nino comparable to these three And then winters. I go back and find that exact number of the strength of the El Nino, what years had that exact number, Got it. that okay. range, and match it up. And one thing I started a couple years ago, and I think you'll agree at home that this just makes sense. It's kind of foolish to start doing averages to project what's happening in the future if you go back to 1950 or even the 1980, because things are changing. So now I am looking at that data and I'm realizing what it is, but I'm really heavily weighing everything from 2000 on okay. because we have changed. We are in a warmer climate. I mean, you can debate what the reason is, but the fact is we are in a warmer climate right now. Plus 2000 is a nice round number. It is a nice, and, and it's not <laughs> as much work for me to do either. Ha ha. All right, uh, here's point two. You may not like this, or you may love it. No, my kids hate this part. Read, the, read it, Drew. Very little Portland snow this winter. And again, this all comes from these comparison three seasons that we just talked about. In fact, if you do the averages or you look at that data, you come up with some years had literally not a flurry of snow, none, hmm. to at most we had three inches. There was, and that would be total snow. There was no big snowstorm. I find the bottom of this to be the most interesting. Read it, Drew. <laughs> Better chance <laughs> of freezing rain. So what I'm telling you is, I, I'm not really seeing any reason to believe we're going to have a snowstorm. We might get a little flickering Zero. of a dusting here or there, but we're not going to have any Now snowstorm. till May, no snowstorm in the Portland metro area. Exactly. But there is an elevated chance that we could have a good old-fashioned freezing rainstorm, and there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a reason for that. These El Nino setups in a flow pattern tend to give us days of more of a south wind. So you've got some warming coming up and the way the pressure models can work that can fuel in to a conflict of east winds coming out of the gorge remember i showed you that map where you get cold air coming into the upper yep. midwest sure that can feed an east wind through the gorge you've got a warm air coming in from the south and the combination can lead to some ice storms so i'm not telling you we're definitely going to have a freezing rainstorm but i'm telling you this is much more likely than snow and an event like this, a freezing rain event, can be even more debilitating yeah. than, than oh, a snow uh, event. Ab absolutely, without question. And then before I bounce off of this, before you sit there at home and go, how does he know there's not going to snow? You're right. I don't. Now keep in mind, I'm simply establishing data sets and I'm running the averages. And that's what I'm sharing with you. If you go back to 1950, every single data set, none of them that I'm aware of are 100%. Right. You may have, out of 20 years you looked at, one has a big snowstorm, the other 19 don't. Well, then I would stand here and go, it's highly unlikely. So that's really what I'm talking about. I'd be lying if I said I remember this winter or this winter, but I do remember this winter, and not that this has anything to do with your winter outlook, but I'm pretty sure the following one, 16, 17, yeah. We had some big snowstorms, like multiple storms in the Portland metro area. So, like, it can flip that quick in a year. Oh, I, I, absolutely. And we did start getting into that run of La Nina winters, which are a little bit more favorable for, for snow. All right, read it, Drew. <laughs> Total rainfall this winter is a wild card. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That goes back to that December 15 graphic that I showed you. And what I just mentioned, you look at all these years, this many of them, well, a lot of them had below normal rainfall, but there are a couple of years that you went like, wow, that was really wet. There's enough of the El Ninos that were outliers that showed really good precipitation that I made the conclusion, I don't do this lightly, I made the conclusion that I can't stand here and tell you I have facts to support one way or the other. So what you're telling me is you have supreme confidence that there will be no snowstorm in the Portland metro area. Supremely confident in that statement. Highly unlikely there would be snow, yes. But you do not have the confidence to stand here and tell us how much rain we're going to see this Correct. week. Correct. I mean, it could go either way. Now, I will tell you, it's, it's more likely if you run the data set that we have a fairly quiet winter, meaning below normal rainfall than above. Statistics would support that, better chance of dry. But there are enough outliers to show wet winters in El Nino years that I just don't feel like I can make that call. You're not going out on a limb. So we're you know gonna, your we're going to leave it at that. It takes a big man to know what they do <laughs> well, and don't know. Everything I'm telling you <laughs> has got to be based on some, some data that I came up with. Read it, Drew. Okay. High wind episodes have an elevated chance. Yeah, and again, that's not me telling you, oh boy, here comes a big <laughs> windstorm. But it is me telling you that when I flipped through these years, and when I also looked at other El Nino years, which I did, at least back to 1980, I did find time and time again, wow, that was a season that had three or four events of south winds gusting 50 to 60 miles per hour. We were under a high wind warning. We had some power outages. We had not widespread damage, but some. And these are the, and I will tell you, if you just go back to the last decade, it seems like these events are on an uptick no matter what 
the cycle of La Nina or El Nino is. It does seem like we're starting to get more of these. And again, and there's a reason. When I moved here in 1999, most of our flow patterns came in from the west northwest. But now we're getting more and more years where the majority of our flow patterns come in from the south. So we're inherently opening up the door to more days where the hmm. south wind, the storms come in, and south winds have the opening of the Willamette Valley for the winds to just keep going, keep going, not be knocked down, not be interrupted, and boom, reach those higher wind speeds and you get these wind events. One of the most uh, famous pieces of video we have in our archives is that uh, video of an old reporter, an older reporter of ours. She no longer works. She's not old, but she no longer works here. Right, Keely yeah, Chalmers. Oh, yes. Yeah. When she was up at Crown Point, literally getting oh, almost yeah. blown off the earth by that windstorm. <laughs> it, that may very well have been right in this winter of 09. Uh, it could have been. I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, that yeah. would not be a south wind event, but always fun to think about wind. Jeez. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye wind on that. Wind is fun. Uh, all right, that was uh, that was the main headlines. We're going to do the recap of what my outlook is here okay. in a moment. But there are some concerns. I alluded this to. I said the stereotype for El Nino is dry, and there's a reason for that stereotype. The, the data overall backs it up. Driest water years. So this is not just winter, but our water years run from October 1 through September September 30th. Driest water years since 1950, which is when we started to track El Nino, La Nina neutral years, are mostly El Nino. In fact, the driest water year was La Nina, 2299. I remember that year, 2000, 2001. But all the rest that make the top five list are El Nino. So there is absolutely the concern that we could have alarmingly low precipitation. Now, we had a decent October. We finished roughly an inch below normal. I, I think we have a really good chance to have a, a normal November. We're starting off with some decent rain. But I, I do think it's really important that we have a good November because we will see increasing chances of, of opening up some dry gaps once we get into December. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. The water year covers a 12-month span. I mean, it's the same total if you go January yes. through. Why did we just make the water year the same as our calendar year? January 1 to December 31st. And across much of the country, that is the case. But in the western U.S., where water storage from snowpack is such an important element, we tie the water year to the snowpack season. That's why it runs starting in October. There you go. So Thank you for explaining. That, that's the reason for that. Okay, now these are the actual, now I'm getting in, this is my actual winter outlook. Okay, this is it. So we take Wait a minute, hold on, down. drum roll or something? No? Well, give me anything. <laughs> what is Maybe it? Maybe we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Highest confidence, I, I always like to tell you, if you've been following along by my outlooks over the years, I always have a highest confidence point. And the highest confidence point this year is that we're going to have a mild above normal winter in terms of temperature. And I actually ran the data, and this is what I come up with. So I'll be following along. November, the month that we're now in, I think when it's all said and done, we're going to average two degrees above normal. Hmm. Now, I will tell you in terms of climate, it doesn't usually catch my attention until you're three degrees above normal. Then you're starting to get significant. But look at December. Ooh. I feel like this is a bold call. The warmest month overall in terms of how much above the climate average we will be. If we go plus 4.5, now you're looking like, all right, historically that may get into the record books. That's a really warm December. That would open the door for concerns about how high the snow level is in the Cascades. I'll show you Mount Hood in just a moment. January back to plus two and February plus three. Backing up. So you're thinking December 25th, Christmas morning, we could be in shorts. Uh, I'm thinking it could Christmas Day could easily be uh, a dry 55 degree day, wow. yes, which would be really mild for us. Yeah, March I, is the one month that I think well maybe there's a little bit of cooling and we're more normal. And again, four out of five of the warmest winters we talked huh. about earlier have been El Nino seasons. Okay, moving on total rainfall. We talked about this. I'm not going to predict it. I don't have the data to back it up. I'm not going to make something up. Should I take a shot? So, or take a shot. I think it's going to be uh, moderate. Moderate rain. Yeah, moderate rainfall between now Which, and March. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I hope you are correct. Yeah, don't hold me on that one, though. So normal precipitation, by the way, just for the five months of, of, that we're talking about, November through March, is just under 24 inches. So, I mean, we always hope we do well, so, so we'll right. see. Uh, I do go, I do say it's just not likely, no big snowstorms. So we have a big snowstorm this winter, then uh, that will be a wrong mark. You'll get me. a red check mark. Yes. Wrong. Total snowfall, nothing about three inches. Interesting, I saw one of the other TV stations in town that are also doing some winter outlook work, and they had the same, I, I just saw it as a viewer, they had the same graph, but their total was zero to one, which I found interesting because I've looked at the data and I ran the averages, and if you run the averages, it is zero to three. All right, freezing, I'm just saying. Someone just got called out. Someone just well, got just, called out right here. I mean, they, you know, <laughs> freezing rain chances elevated, not 
Telling you we're going to have a freezing rain chance, but I think that is a much better option for us than snow this winter. So we'll see. If we're going to go that far to call someone out like that, should we just go ahead and mention the call letters as well? No, we're, I, we'll I'm go just on. saying I just found it. I don't know where they came up with the zero to one. because I like putting things up that you can actually run statistics and you can show people where you found the number. Again, no confidence in the rainfall amount, but very confident. No snow. Yes. Got and, it. And, and it's going to be interesting to see if we get an ice storm. It'll All be right. Interesting. All right. Let's talk about Mount Hood, right? We've shown you this before. Mount Hood Inso Cycle Snow Climate. Inso Cycle is, is La Nina, El Nino neutral. La Nina's, which we had the last three winters, and we had decent snowpacks. If you run the averages uh, since 1999, that's your best bet to have a good snow year, 104%. Neutral year, second place, 88. El Nino years come in worst at 76% if you run all the averages up on Mount Hood since 1999 for the Mount Hood test site at 5,400 feet. Now, hmm. stay with me, Drew. I'm with you. So I went back and I ran the averages for the El Nino years that I was looking at specifically, and they came out just a little bit lower than the overall average of 74%. So I'm predicting when they measure the total snow for the season, which is April 30th or May 1st, whichever date that's done on, it varies, but the end of April, basically. 74% will look back and say we had a 74% of average snow year up on Mount Hood. Now, this is concerning to me, potential slow start to the season through the holidays. Now, think about this. It's been a long time since we've had a Christmas day that where if you drove up to government camp, there was literally no snow on the ground. I have fear that this could be one of those years because remember I'm saying December is going to be really warm yeah. and if I'm right that would be a lot of rain at 5,000 feet and not snow for example. Uh, so and if Ski Bowl would have 20 inches of preserved base of 4,000 that little of a base they may or may not be open there could very easily be nothing where they're not preserving the snow and that would be good. We're not talking so, Thanksgiving we're talking Christmas. Chris into the Christmas break yeah. so that's my biggest concern here for recreation purposes. You know, 74% of average snow on Mount Hood, it may not sound great, but the reality is uh, Dave Tragathon, long time, he retired, but he was a long time uh, spokesperson up at Mount Hood Meadows. Right. You met Dave. Yep. Um, Dave would tell you, it's not so much how much snow we get that makes a great season for recreation up there. It's the quality of the snow and when does it fall? If the snow always falls on Friday, that's great because that's the weekend. Right. So don't get so hung up on that. But this is a concern of mine for recreation. And obviously, we need as much water storage as we can. We came off a really good year. I don't think it's going to be as good a year this year. Hmm. And that is the winter outlook this year, sir. That's it. That's period. That's the last graphic. That's the last graphic. I wasn't, I just, yeah. I wasn't ready for it so, to be over. We got a, a mild winter, especially December. We're not sure how much rain we're going to get or not get. We don't think we're going to have a snowstorm, but we're thinking odds are decent. We would have a freezing rain event. And we're keeping our eyes out for maybe uh, more than normal of those uh, 50 to 60 mile per hour windy events coming in too. The last thing I'll mention then is that Rod has proven to be very good at this winter outlook thing the last several years. So we'll see how he fares this year sometime next spring. And it means a lot to me that you just take the time to listen to my work. Uh, it's important to me. So I'll follow along like you will at home. We'll see how I do. Good job, buddy. Thanks, Drew.